One of the best games of 2024 was a ray tracing exclusive, requiring at least an Nvidia RTX, AMD RX 6000 or Intel Arc GPU to run, and it's actually not alone. Although games like Black Myth Wukong and Stalker 2 don't have that same hardware barrier to entry, they still use non-optional software ray tracing for rendering graphics. If you are thinking this now 6 year old RT trend was a phase developers would eventually grow out of, it doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. With ray tracing becoming harder and harder to avoid, how will older and cheaper hardware cope? This video was brought to you by AliExpress and their Team Up Cashback promotion. Join the Iceberg Tech team before shopping and the money you spend on AliExpress.com will help to increase the team's score. The higher we score as a team, the more store credit you'll receive back afterwards, from a minimum of 2% cashback all the way up to 10%. The more you buy, the more you save. The more you buy, the more you save. Scan the QR code on screen now or use the link below to join the team and don't forget to use my exclusive discount codes at checkout. To be clear, there are different degrees of RT. At the top of the stack is path tracing and it's super demanding. Only the very best GPUs in the GeForce RTX series can even consider it and even then not without some degree of upscaling. Path tracing and other heavy ray tracing modes like Cyberpunk 2077's Psycho mode are pretty much irrelevant for the average gamer when they can have a better time without them. Lately however, we're seeing more games adopt the lightweight, hardware agnostic ray traced global illumination used by UE5's Lumen and other similar engines. This isn't a nice to have visual effect like fancier reflections or shadows, well it isn't just that. It's the way the whole game's rendered and it can't be so easily ignored. Some of these titles simply won't run without it. Thankfully this technology is lightweight enough that it doesn't always need dedicated RT hardware to run and so is sometimes called software RT, but it's still more demanding than the rasterized rendering usually used in games up until recently and not all GPUs are going to be up to the task. As my primary interests are talking about older and cheaper graphics cards, I wanted to know how those GPUs could hold up in a future where potentially every game uses this kind of ray tracing. Starting with, ok it's kind of a meme, the RX 6300 is the worst RT capable graphics card I own and you can't really buy it anywhere, which is probably for the best. It has 768 shader units and 12 compute units the same as the integrated graphics found in a lot of recent Ryzen APUs, but don't let that fool you. Its slower clock speeds and 2GB of VRAM mean that it's way slower than even a Steam Deck. You shouldn't buy one of these GPUs, but if you can find one they cost about 50 to 60 pounds, so they are at least better value than a GT710. Next up one of the most popular graphics cards of all time, the GTX 1060. Yes, that's GTX, meaning this graphics card lacks any dedicated RT hardware and so will automatically be disqualified from playing Indiana Jones and the Great Circle or any other games with these same hardware requirements. However, it's still one of the best GPUs out there on the second hand market for people on a very tight budget and it's still kind of relevant in every game that doesn't require RT to run. The RTX 3050 6GB is the cheapest RTX GPU on the new market and it's also the worst RTX series GPU ever made for desktop. It costs about 2 to 3 times as much as a used 6GB 1060 and is priced on par with something like a used RX 6600 or RTX 2060, both of which should perform a little better in this scenario. I actually don't have an RX 6600 for comparison, but what I do have is this, the 10GB RX 6750 GRE, aka the RX 6700. This is close to the RX 7600 in performance, only with more VRAM, but it's more interesting to me because it's the same GPU as the base model PS5. The 10GB 6750 Golden Rabbit Edition 
henceforth referred to as the GRE, has apparently recently been discontinued, but I did see a couple of examples still up for sale on AliExpress, and I'll have one linked below. Next we have the Intel Arc B580. This GPU has shaken up the sub $300 market recently, with its 12GB frame buffer, XESS upscaling and frame generation, and better RT than comparably priced Radeons. It's not one for slapping in a budget build, however. The Battlemage GPUs rely on Gen 4 PCI Express and resizable bar, and thanks to serious driver overhead, it can be easily bottlenecked by even quite powerful older CPUs. Still, if you're thinking about building a new PC in 2025, this might very well be on your wish list. The RTX 4060, which at about $300 brand new despite having reduced PCIe bandwidth, memory bus width and VRAM amount, represents just about everything wrong with the Ada Lovelace generation of graphics cards and, indeed, modern PC gaming. It's also the most popular card in this test these days, despite those shortcomings, so if you haven't already been swayed by the B580, this might be something you're considering for your next PC. Finally, the RTX 2080 Ti might seem a little out of place. This first gen RT flagship is only available on the used market these days, and depending on where you are in the world, it might be incredibly expensive. However, here in the UK it can be had for about the same price as the B580, or slightly more. GeForce cards have driver overhead issues of their own, but it's a little more tolerant of older systems than the Intel, so if you are looking for an entry into RT gaming with a decent amount of VRAM, the 2080 Ti might be on your radar. Given the tiers of GPU being covered, I decided this wasn't an appropriate use case for my new test rig, so I've returned to my Ryzen 5 7500F system instead. However, I should add the caveat that this 6-core Zen 4 chip is actually surprisingly good for its price, being essentially a 7600 minus the integrated graphics, and if you're looking at pairing some of these GPUs with, say, a Zen 2 or older CPU, or even Zen 3 in the case of the Intel B580, you might not quite see the same performance. Let's start with the proverbial elephant in the room. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle is the first mainstream game that requires a graphics card with ray tracing hardware on board. If it has GTX in the name, or it's a Radeon RX 5000 series or older, it's just not going to work. I normalised my results at 1080p low settings, which is perhaps a bit low for some of these GPUs, but for others it's way too much. I did manage to get into the game with the RX 6300, but performance was woeful. I had to leave Satipo and the boys behind, they were moving too slow. The B580 unfortunately comes up second worst, but that's a bug that will hopefully one day be fixed. I'm using the latest drivers available as of the 19th of January 2025, which state in the patch notes that they fixed the issue, but they clearly haven't. The RTX 3050 is broadly playable at 1080p low, but really needs quality DLSS to hit a 60 average, and due to its 6GB frame buffer, it can't actually go any higher in terms of quality settings. The GRE hits nearly 90fps at the normalised settings, and having 10GB means we can actually turn the quality up. But as the medium preset drops performance to just over 60fps, then going any higher would require upscaling, which the game doesn't really support yet outside of Nvidia GPUs. Speaking of, the RTX 4060 reaches 98fps at 1080p low, and has enough performance to handle medium at 80fps, but the 8GB limit means high is out of the question. The 2080 Ti meanwhile has both sides covered, so as well as managing 122fps in the normalised tests, it can actually go all the way up to Ultra and still see 86fps. Stalker 2 is one of a couple of games featured in this test that runs on Unreal Engine 5, whose lumen feature can deliver RT global <laughs> global illumination can deliver RT global illumination even without dedicated RT hardware. I normalised this comparison once again at 1080p low, and the RX 6300, to its credit, actually turned up at um, 4 FPS or 9 with FSR. Meanwhile, the RTX plus GeForce can manage 22 FPS. Hitting 30 requires FSR performance, at which point the game looks like pure trash. 
On the subject of trash, the RTX 3050 is only 50% faster at ray tracing than the non-RTX card, averaging 33 FPS at 1080p low. Adding performance upscaling helps make things more playable, and DLSS means it's slightly less ugly, but only slightly. Although the Radeon beats the 3050 soundly, it's still not a great result in the wider context. 48 FPS on average without upscaling isn't terrible, and it can hit 60 FPS with balanced FSR, but the other cards do much better. The B580 starts off pretty hopefully, almost hitting 60 FPS at standardised settings, but when it comes to trying to get a little bit more out of it, I found that XCSS doesn't seem to do all that much. At 1080p medium, I had to drop to XCSS balanced to get a 60 average. The RTX 4060 is only a few frames ahead of the B580 at the basic settings, but DLSS actually seems to work, and I was able to run at high with quality upscaling and hit similar FPS to the Intel card at medium balanced. Finally, the 2080 Ti technically wins by a few frames, but it's close enough to the 4060 to be negligible. Star Wars Outlaws is not using UE5, but the Snowdrop engine uses the same principle for its RTGI system, which had previously been used in Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. The bad news is that the GTX 1060 doesn't seem to want to play, crashing every time I load my save. This is kind of weird. I've seen other people successfully play the game on this GPU, but perhaps it's because I've saved in a busier area. The 3050 gives a clue as to why the game's a problem for the 1060, as the 6GB frame buffer proves to be a major issue. At 1080p low, which are my standardised settings for this game, the 3050 chugs along at 12fps, only 1.5 frames ahead of the RX 6300 at 720p. DLSS performance is transformative, not just in frame rate, but also image quality. Yes, this amount of upscaling is blurry as all hell, but at least now the textures actually load in. The standardised results for the next three GPUs are all very close, but things got interesting when I started to increase quality. The GRE can run at the high preset, and with balanced upscaling it manages roughly 60fps. Not an ideal experience perhaps, but the option is there. The 4060 is functionally equal at 1080 low, and at 1080 medium with DLSSQ it's actually very smooth and playable but it can't hit the high preset even with upscaling, as it will, at best, stutter and fail to load textures, and at worst, just straight up crash. The 2080 Ti takes the gold medal, running 20% faster than the 4060 in the normalised comparison, and still able to hit playable frame rates at the high preset with a little quality DLSS. Just try not to think about what it's doing for your electricity bill. Metro Exodus is not an RT exclusive game. The 2021 Enhanced Edition, however, is. This version is using RTGI, which again makes ray tracing hardware an absolute necessity. There are three presets in the benchmarking utility, High, Ultra and Extreme, the first of which is being used as the normalised test settings. The 3050 can only manage to hit 40 FPS at these settings, requiring balanced DLSS to hit 60. The Radeon is a good 80% faster, and should be perfectly playable even turned up to Ultra. The B580 technically slides in just below the RTX 4060, but it's within the margin of error, both cards are practically the same and run just fine at Ultra too. The 2080 Ti meanwhile is in a different league, and we could perhaps talk about it playing at 1440p. Returning to UE5 one last time for Black Myth Wukong, and the normalised settings are once more 1080p low, though with a major caveat that you really shouldn't play at these settings, especially if you're sensitive to flickering images. In several areas, the shadows go absolutely nuts on every single GPU I tested, and I'm surprised this managed to pass through beta testing without at least warranting some kind of health warning. Still, I pressed on from a purely academic standpoint, and was actually happy to say hello once again to the GTX 1060. I wasn't surprised, I managed to run the benchmark on a GT710 last year, so I knew this was possible, but it's actually performing better than I thought. The GTX 1060 averages over 30fps, and can pass 60 with some quite aggressive upscaling. 
The 3050 is, once more, only 50% ahead of the old GTX card, though this means it can get away with much less upscaling using DLSS rather than FSR. The B580 represents the lowest card tested that can actually play the game at reasonable frame rates without triggering a seizure, capable of 60fps at 1080p high with 40% XESS upscaling. The GRE can handle lower amounts of upscaling, achieving more frames at 67% of 1080p, though of course this is FSR, not XESS, so it might not actually look all that much better. The 4060 and 2080 Ti are a close race at 1080p low, and at high, with 67% DLSS, they're virtually tied. The extra VRAM of the Turing card might make it more desirable at some combination of quality settings, but neither GPU is a good choice for path tracing, so this is probably about as high as you're going to take them. So, in the event of a mass industry-wide switch to purely ray-traced rendering, just how screwed are you? If you have an RX 6300, very much so, but you probably knew that already. If you have something in the same category as a GTX 1060, like a GTX 1650 or RX 580, I wouldn't say you're totally beyond hope. Even if every exciting title to release in 2025 were to use software ray tracing, there's a chance you might get to enjoy them at low settings with some upscaling. Well, enjoy might be a strong word, but you can hopefully get 30 FPS out of them. Perhaps the mighty 1080 Ti would still be able to crack 60 FPS without heavy upscaling, but I'll be looking at how the GOAT is performing in 2025 once we actually have a few 2025 releases to test it with. If I have any advice to give off the back of this video, it's that anyone looking to upgrade their 1060 or equivalent should probably skip the cheapest RT models. Cards like the RTX 3050 6GB and the RX 6400 and 6500 XT ostensibly support hardware accelerated ray tracing, and so check that particular box in games like Indiana Jones, but they're not going to be as big an upgrade as you might want or expect, and having less than 8GB of VRAM is still going to be restrictive even in relatively lightweight RT titles. Thanks again to AliExpress for sponsoring the video, don't forget to join my team using the link below, and get some sweet discount using the exclusive codes on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.